of the international network of taxonomic collaborators because obviously the, um, the two lead um, principal investigators, they were only specifically interested in flies and certain wasps, but then they collected a lot of other things. So they ended up with 120 taxonomic collaborators and with more than 70 research papers, mostly describing new taxa in this area. So very successful in that, in that sense. Um, our own contribution was we're the, um, the Heteroptera um, network essentially in that in a project. So we're organizing the, the true bugs. And so far we've, um, when I'm saying incorporated into revisionary studies, I mean we've databased all these specimens. So that specimen available and images in many cases, they're out there, are freely available. One of the big project, uh, problems with these projects is that getting the funding for the sampling is one thing, and that's very easy, or not, I don't want to s ever say that, nothing is easy, but that's feasible. Um, versus then actually f getting the funding to do the research and actually describe the species, or just you know, database the specimens and get the information out there, that's much more difficult. So in this project, what really happened was the digitization was really part of the taxonomic revision. So there wasn't any independent digitization efforts happening. And then also one problem, and this is actually true for all these three projects, is the quantification of the inventory um, outcomes is not really quite clear. It's clear for the target groups of organisms, but then the overall, how many specimens were collected, how many were incorporated into revisions, and how much biodiversity data has become available, that's not really um, happening sometimes. Okay, uh, and um, a project closer to here is the Madagascar Arthropod Biodiversity Project. Um, there was a collaboration between the Cali uh, California Academy of Sciences and the uh, Tsimbazaza Botanical Zoological Park. And you see here some of the goals. So there was a whole long list of goals, obviously. But again, it's very important to look into um, promoting understanding of entomology through training. So there are a lot of training components in there. And then also the interesting thing about this project was there was really an assistance in developing a national arthropod collection in Madagascar, which obviously is very beneficial. So there was a tighter integration between the inventory part and the actual collection part. Okay, and also this project was really good in um, getting a lot of the biodiversity data out there, in particular for ants, which was the focus of this project. So a lot of the specimens were data-based and that information is out there. A lot of the specimens were also imaged. And if you're interested in a project, it's very easy to find. This is one of the web um, pages or generally it's just any information on ants and web.org is really the place to go to. Okay, and this is really impressive. Over the last 12 years, field crews have um, inventoried 112 sites across Madagascar. They've processed over a million specimens and they've found, for ants alone, over 800 new species. So that's really, really phenomenal, obviously, and a real big, um, um, well, a real big thing to add that much knowledge on biodiversity in Madagascar, obviously. So again, our own limited um, contribution is we're looking at red beards and um, we didn't add quite as many species to that. So there were 240 species of assassin bugs already known from Madagascar and we're adding about 50 or 60 to them. <coughs> okay, and the final project, um, LAMA, um, that's very interesting too. It's really building on the knowledge that was already there in Costa Rica and it's, it's extending essentially south and north to look into other countries in Mesoamerica and um, capitalize on some of these efforts. So the signature tags are here again are ants um, and weevils and they're specifically looking at leaf litter which is a very specialized habitat. You have to have specialized um, techniques obviously you collect them. Um, it ran for four years, four countries and again, a very close in-country collaboration and training. And the way the training was set up was very neat. They had field crews of, it was always half, um, half students from the country, um, the host country, and then half the students came from the United States. So it was a very nice integrative way of doing things. And then also they have a great online presence. So they have all their protocols, for example, online. Um, nice little videos. I might have the chance to show one of those in a you know 
relaxing moment. Okay, so my argument here is that obviously we need to work on the biological collections, but it's also important to um, close taxonomic and geographic gaps because it's clear that the biodiversity data are in the two places and we need to kind of keep both of them in mind. We need strong international collaborations, training components are important, infrastructure building, this is another outcome of that Madagascar project, the uh, Madagascar Biodiversity Center. Um, they're very successful for the target taxa. It's a little difficult to know exactly what the bycatch is. And obviously funding for the curation and the taxonomic research is really critical. Okay, with that, just some um, you know, final, final um, reflections on more like data quality really and how the biological collections really tie in with the data quality. So obviously specimen preparation, curation is a really important thing. So specimens should be prepared such that they can be handled efficiently because the whole thing about biodiversity informatics obviously is defining or developing the workflow such that they are really efficient, that the whole data capture can be done in most efficient ways. So specimens that swim in bulk samples, they are really not accessible. So they are typically excluded from projects. And also, obviously, if a collection looks like that, that just makes everyone cry. So I always show that my students just to make sure they're <laughs> treating their insect collections properly. Um, specimen labeling, very important, obviously, part of the whole curation process, right? And cryptic field codes. And this is, you know, anyone who's done field work probably comes home with field codes, and it takes effort to then transfer them into actual labels. And then also the organization within a collection is really important. So it's the you know, best approach for um, an efficient data capture again, is specimens organized by taxon first, so you know, families and genera, species, so on. Then locality, collection event, sex, and that allows you to very effective and efficiently enter and capture those data. Okay, obviously um, new acces um, accessions pose constant challenges to every collection because that means you need people to help you with um, a lot of the routine, preparing specimens and labeling and all that. In many cases, the historical collections are really the well-curated ones. So this is Tervuren, for example, a collection, at least for the Redivirts, I think the last 50 years, not a single specimen has been added to this collection but a collection is in perfect shape. So you could essentially just take that and start databasing that straight away. I don't think it's being done at the moment, but it would be very simple. Um, <clears throat> another thing is what's become a standard in many collections is that you have um, unit trays that allow for reorganization of the collection very effectively, again, because it allows you to combine everything that belongs to a family and a genus in such a way that you can streamline the process and then also, um, a lot of the tasks obviously can be handled by um, trained undergrad students, for example. So that's what we're using a lot of our undergrad students to just help with these um, tasks. <coughs> okay, this is a black hole. And that's there because uh, you know, one of my favorite topics when we, when we talk about all the biodiversity, informatics, biodiversity data, which is really uh, a specimen identification. And again, you look at vertebrate collections, not such a big deal. A lot of them are really well curated, um, very straightforward to identify. It's not quite as true for the botanical world, but it's still better than for invertebrates, obviously. And this is the publication I briefly mentioned earlier, my Deco in 2004. Um, they looked into specimen data from natural history um, collections and they found, so they did essentially, the, they did a revision, looked at all the specimens very critically, and they found even among the specimens that were identified to species, about 60 to 70 percent of the specimens were misidentified. So this is a small thing, it was a small revision of rubber flies, um, a group of diptera, <coughs> And it might be uh, really, really high. So I don't think in Redivirates we see quite as high numbers, but still, this really makes you wonder about the data. If we just go into a collection and start databasing with something someone has identified at some point, we might end up with a lot of rubbish in and consequently a lot of rubbish out. And this is why I think the whole 
taxonomy um, impediment really ties into that whole question. So obviously also, um, this is what we're finding quite frequently um, in insect collections. So they were sorted to subfamily because someone who's not an expert in that group can say, okay, they're all red viets, they all belong to the kissing bugs or triatomine, but I can't really identify them any further. Or we see completely unsorted um, drawers. <coughs> Obviously, there's limited value specimen data. Specimens are not identified to species level or not accurately identified. But species level identification obviously is time consuming. Um, what helps a little bit, although again, not a silver bullet, is if you have students, graduate students, for example, um, helping with pre-sorting of the collections. <coughs> so that's what we did last summer. Um, or somewhere before actually as part of that Vedivia training grant, we visited a bunch of collections in our vicinity. I took two or three undergrad students, two of my grad students, piled them all into a van and we went there for a day and went just crazy in these collections. And by the end of the day, they were organized to such a level that you know, an expert can start actually working with them in a more efficient way. But then it's still important obviously that the experts help to identify these collections. Okay, solutions. Well, you can follow the recommendation that my Indico has essentially given for biodiversity data in the invertebrate world. <coughs> you really want to rely where you can on revisionary data. And in a way, examples for that are the, um, not only this publication, but also what came out of a lot of these planetary biodiversity inventories, such for example, all the plant bug data that was entered into the database that I'm going to be introducing tomorrow because this is all data that's been looked at by the expert, really. So this is prime data. <coughs> and then also in these ADBC, these advancing the digitization of biological collections, we're trying to do that as much as we can, although the overall data quality is never going to be as good as what we see in these PBIs or also these PEED projects. But what we're trying to do is A, prioritize the digitization in collections such that we try to capture those parts of the collection that are best identified. And then sometimes we just disregard certain other parts that would take too much time and effort to actually identify them. That's one thing. And the other thing is we were sending experts around to a number of collections to just be in a collection for three day we gave them food and gave them a bottle of beer in the evening and then we locked them up for the entire day till late in the evening and made them work really hard and that you know, helps a lot obviously because if you bring an expert in, they can do a lot of stuff in very little time. Another solution that's been promoted is remote curation. Um, for example, GigaPen is one of the projects, again, that's whole drawer imaging. And these whole drawer images are, you know, as you can see quite well. And in this case, GigaPan was not just for, you know, this is what the drawers look like, this is the specimens we have, but they're really trying to encourage people to get involved and tell them, you know, an expert, a bumblebee expert, can tell you what species that is fairly easily. So to come in and actually help annotate these um, drawers, that's one way. Um, and then other ways, obviously, again, is um, um, to focus on type specimens, just because if you have images of type specimens and you make them publicly available, then curators in their own collections can very quickly reference the specimens they have in front of them against these type specimen collections. They're, you know, apart from the American Museum, really, it's a lot more um, focused on smaller taxonomic groups. For example, we're doing that as part of the Red Viet um, PEAT project. And obviously you're seeing we're not quite as, you know, we can't do them all. We just can do a part of it, some collections we're going to. Okay, and that's my, my last thing really. Obviously I think I've driven the point home that taxonomy and knowing your species is really important. And that's also quite obviously that taxonomy training is really important. So um, having said that, um, we from Europe always felt that the Americans, like those people, <laughs> they were sort of a step ahead and they were doing things right. They had programs such as this PEAT, that training, um, taxonomic training programs really as big NSF programs. 
Um, unfortunately, as of last year, these programs were discontinued, which I think is really a, a horrible thing to have happened. Um, on a positive side, even a typical National Science Foundation grant has typically very um, um, significant training components. So you typically would include students, graduate students, as well as undergrad students in them. And then also, obviously, I've, um, I believe that international training is very important and international would be between Europe and Africa and Australia and the United States and South America so as international as possible. My lab is a pretty good example for that. We are fairly international um, overall. Um, one thing we're trying to promote is research visits um, in, uh, in host countries. Um, there are really cool initiatives happening in Brazil at the moment. It's amazing. So there's these research for undergrad students projects where uh, Brazilian undergrad would work very closely with a North American undergrad and they spent time at each other's respective institution. And there's cool things like Tervuren, the um, Africa um, Museum, has an internship um, program, for example, but then also uh, graduate studies abroad. So those are some of the undergrads that were in my lab. Okay, yeah, and let's forget about it. <laughs> Yeah, and this was um, something, and I'm probably just going to be sending that out to everyone at some point. I thought that would be you know, something from a greedy perspective too, because I would be interested in hearing your opinion on, on things like that. Not right now, but maybe on Wednesday after we've actually visited um, the collections around here. Um, so what do you know about biological collections in your home country? Um, what about the feasibility of really contributing to as I would call them virtual meta collections, that it could be on you know, these insect overview drawers. Um, are you contributing to specimen databasing initiatives, or you know what are the what are the potentials? And would you know about biodiversity inventories in your home countries? And I thought as a little challenge or something, we could you know just think of how would you in your in a project that you would run in your, from your home institution or in a country, how would you design the workflows really from a biodiversity inventory to the biological collections and the digitization of them? So what would you think are the challenges, like the particular challenges in your, for your case study essentially, um, and how would you overcome them? And I think if we can discuss that at some point on you know, Wednesday afternoon or Thursday or so, I think that would be cool. <laughs>